Officially, good evening and welcome to Union Station our, in our Rainier Extreme Screen Theater for this very special event made possible by the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and Union Station's presentation of Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. I'm Michael Tritt, Chief Marketing Officer for Union Station. It, it is our sincere pleasure to host our ongoing speaker series and invite you to participate in these important discussions. To date, over 225,000 people have purchased tickets or attended the Auschwitz exhibition presented by Bank of America and here at Union Station through the end of January. Has anyone been through the exhibition? I'd say that's the, the vast majority. If you haven't, however, had a chance yet to experience this world-class content and encounter with history, I encourage you to make your reservations just as soon as possible. When we first considered bringing the exhibition to Kansas City, we were especially moved by the Spanish producer's personal and professional mission to do something, in his words. And so we are doing something to educate, to empower, to engage, and to cause actionable discussion. That's what tonight is about. And this is in the form of the exhibition as well as these powerful speaker presentations. So at the end of this evening, and as you travel through the week, we hope you will also feel compelled to do something with the content you are about to encounter. Finally, our deep appreciation once again goes to our partners at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. None of this would be possible without their passion and participation. Jessica is here with us tonight, and her partner Shelley. Thank you so much. Now, help me welcome Jessica Rockhold, MCHE Executive Director, who will introduce our speaker, our featured speaker for this evening. Thank you, Michael. We are so deeply appreciative for this uh, partnership and the opportunity that Union Station has created to have these speakers and, and these dialogues in our community, it would have been easy to have this exhibition and say that's education, we've done it. And they took the next step in making sure that we had these robust conversations. When this exhibit opened in June, Dr. Michael Berenbaum stood on this stage and he referred to the title of the exhibition, Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, as an indictment against humanity, that we had not done enough with the knowledge that we have gained from the Holocaust, with the perspective that we have gained over 80 years, we have not done enough to stop these kinds of actions in our world. That 80 years on, this should be long ago far away, and it is not. One of the foundational elements of the Holocaust is that it is predicated on anti-Semitism, and that continues to be an issue that we grapple with in a worldwide stage. It is an American issue, it is a European issue, it is a worldwide issue. In Holocaust education, we always prioritize making sure that our learners have foundational knowledge of anti-Semitism. We want them to have historical information about how anti-Semitism has changed through the centuries and how it leads up to the Nazi version of anti-Semitism. Too often, though, we only look at it historically and, and in our rearview mirror. What we wanted to do when we contemplated this series is make sure that we were being forward-looking, that, as Michael said, we were moving to actionable response and having that dialogue. And it is um, with that in mind that we approached our friends and colleagues at the Jew Jewish Community Relations Bureau, AJC, in Overland Park. Um, Executive Director Gabriella Geller and her team are our colleagues that we, we go to every time that we see an anti-Semitic incident in our community, and we often work together in response to that, especially when there's a Holocaust component to that, but they are our agency in Kansas City uh, looking at this issue. And so it was a natural partnership, and we're so appreciative that they not only were willing to partner with us, but that they recommended tonight's speaker. It is on their recommendation that we reached out to Holly and brought her here today. A really quick logistical note, we are going to take questions at the end of Holly's presentation, and we're going to do that in a written format. When you came in, I hope you saw the white note cards. At a certain point, you'll be asked to pass those to the end of the aisle, 
and will be joined at the end uh, by JCRB AJC's Executive Director, Gabriela Geller, who will moderate those questions back to our presenter. And so with that, it is truly my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Holly Huffnagel is the AJC US Director for Combating Anti-Semitism. Before joining AJC, Holly worked at the US State Department as a policy advisor to the Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. She has served as a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. Her own background includes um, her education in pre-war Jewish life and the Holocaust, specifically in Poland and Northern Slovakia. She's an ideal person to lead us in this dialogue and it's my pleasure to welcome her tonight. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So thank you for the introduction and the welcome. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening. This is actually my first in-person presentation since March of 2020. Um, so it's wonderful to see you um, and not as boxes on a Zoom screen. So I am so glad to be here in Kansas City. I came here from Washington, DC this morning. So the title of this evening's lecture is 75 years after Auschwitz, anti-Semitism in America. But before we ask the big questions, why is anti-Semitism rising? What is happening? And what can we really do about it? I actually want to start with a story, um, something that happened just last week, a week ago today. And I want to take you with me to Crete, um, one of the biggest, the biggest island in Greece, which I had the privilege of visiting uh, last week. And Crete has an ancient Jewish history. It actually dates back to the third and fourth centuries BCE. And in the Venetian and Ottoman influenced town called Hania, and I don't know if any of you in the audience have been to Crete, but uh, I highly recommend the visit. There is this Etz Hanim synagogue. Etz Hanim means tree of life in Hebrew. And it's a building that dates back to the 15th centuries, the 15th century. And it's a Romaniote synagogue referring to Jews who trace their origins to the Hellenized Greek-speaking Jews of the Eastern Mediterranean in the Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman empires, um, all of which actually occupied Greece. So there's a long legacy here. And I was able to visit the inside of this synagogue. And as I passed through the main sanctuary to um, a kind of a small courtyard, I took this picture on the wall of the inside of the synagogue. And it's a Holocaust memorial. And there's a little candle, and, and even though it was the middle of the day, the, the, the flame was still flickering, giving light. And there was a little gold plaque right underneath the candle. And I want to read you um, what that plaque says. It's the words from, from the Bible, from uh, the prophet Isaiah. And it says, but now this is what the Lord says. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. These verses about passing through the waters take on added meaning when one learns about the fate of Crete's Jewish community. While the Nazis occupied the island of Crete in 1941, it wasn't until June 1944 that they boarded Crete's Jews onto this ship, the SS Tenais, which was bound for mainland Greece for the Jews to be deported by train to Auschwitz. And on June 9th, this ship was actually heading into the port of Piraeus, um, which would lead to Athens, when a British commander of a submarine saw it coming in and thought it was a German military vessel and ordered that this ship be torpedoed. 
And what happened was the ship sunk and nearly all of the Jews on board drowned. Um, about, about 300 Jews drowned. And in, in effect, it ended the existence of a community that had lived on the island of Crete for 2,300 years. And I open with this story um, because of its connection to tonight's lecture, actually. And I want to do three things to set the stage this evening. The very first thing I want to do is go back to the title. We're over 75 years now, um, you know, 80 years after the Holocaust. And anti-Semitism, this hostility towards Jews, not only did not go away, but today it's actually rising in Greece. It's rising in Europe, where the Holocaust took place, and it's also rising here in the United States. And here in the US, 75 years after Auschwitz, this, you know, the notorious concentration and death camp complex uh, in Nazi-occupied Poland, 48% of American millennials today and Gen Zers, so people between the ages of 18 and 39, don't know the word Auschwitz. In fact, they actually can't name any concentration camp or ghetto um, in, in Europe, 48% on average. And in the state of Missouri, for instance, that number is 50%. So 50% of young people in Missouri don't know, can't name a concentration camp or, or ghetto. The study, and this is what this map up here reveals, the study also showed that 63% of Americans aged 18 to 39 do not know that six million Jews were murdered. And perhaps one of the most disturbing revelations is that 11% believe Jews caused the Holocaust. I'll say that again. More than one in 10 young Americans, again, aged 18 to 39, think Jews caused the Holocaust. They might have heard of the Holocaust, they might have heard about Jews, and then when asked, 11% was that answer. So we have to think about this when we talk about anti-Semitism in America today. The second framing piece I want to mention is defining anti-Semitism. You, you know, us in this audience, especially so many of you who visited the exhibit already, you know, probably you know, have an answer ready, but it's surprising how many people don't know what it is. And so for our conversation tonight, we define anti-Semitism by saying that it's a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as a hatred towards Jews. Now, the word itself is modern. It comes actually from the 19th century. Um, but really today, it acts as an umbrella term covering you know, two millennia of, of anti-Jewish prejudice and hostility uh, you know, until, until today. And that's actually one of the reasons why anti-Semitism is called the longest hatred. And I'll actually note here, um, and some of you might have encountered this, there's some confusion about the word itself. And that's over the word Semitic. So the word Semitic is actually a linguistic term. Uh, it refers to a set of languages from the Middle East. Uh, those descendant languages consist of Arabic, um, Amharic, and you know, Ethiopia, Hebrew. Um, but anti-Semitism only refers to, to Jews. So there's no race or people who are Semites. There's just people who speak Semitic languages. Um, but when that word was coined, it was only in reference to Jews. It doesn't refer to Arabs. It doesn't refer to Ethiopians, for instance. And that's really important when we talk about um, you know, what is anti-Semitism, why we don't hyphenate it hyphenate the word. I think sometimes in English um, it autocorrects to a hyphen between the anti and the Semitism. But there really is no such thing as Semitism you know, to be against. Quickly though, to go back to this definition, I want to spend a brief moment on this certain perception piece. You might just pass over that and, and think, OK, it's a hatred or a hostility towards Jews. But the certain perception piece is so critical and I want to explain why. Anti-Semitism is, is more than a hatred of Jews. It's also a conspiracy. And this is really what differentiates anti-Semitism from other forms of hatred, of bigotry, of racism. So when we think about 
conspiracy. You know, what is conspiracy? It's this idea that there is an evil someone or something that's exploiting humanity. You know, someone is controlling, you know, the levers or affecting me or my community. And to the anti-Semite, Jews are this person in power. So this is the key difference here. When we think about um, other forms of racism, um, which vilify their victims as inferior. Now, Jews historically and even today have been, vilif have, have been and are vilified as inferior, especially from the far right, from white supremacists. But what's different is that anti-Semitism also vilifies you know, its victims as quote unquote superior, as having too much power, too much privilege, too much wealth, and attacks them for that. No other hatred has this element like anti-Semitism does. And this is really important in our understanding of what we're even seeing now um, when we look at all of the sources of anti-Semitism. So for instance, especially in conversations today about, uh, about uh, rightful conversations, but about anti-racism, about you know, social justice, there often are questions of power. And where does anti-Semitism fit in is a question that I want to leave us with when Jews are assailed because of their you know, perceived power. And the third thing I want to briefly mention is the history of anti-Semitism in America. So today we're talking about just right now, after the Holocaust, like 75 years, 80 years after the Holocaust, but what about the history of anti-Semitism in America? And I actually want to note a couple of positive things. I think this is really important. We must acknowledge that the American Jewish experience is actually unparalleled to any other Jewish experience in the diaspora, so Jews living outside of the state of Israel. When we look at American Jews' experience here in America, it's actually quite good. Um, yes, there is anti-Semitism. It, it wasn't necessarily easy. Um, Jews face discrimination. But compared to, to Europe, to, to North Africa, to the Middle East, Jews have fared very well here in America. And I want to mention two things. The first is that the advancement of civil equality under the law for Jews following the Revolutionary War helped ensure that government-sponsored anti-Semitism would not take root here as it had in Europe. The second aspect is that the underpinnings of our democracy, the diversity of, of life here, the fact that we are a nation of immigrants, um, also helped ensure that the pervasive and even deadly anti-Semitism that would lead to the Holocaust wouldn't happen here. Doesn't mean that we can't be vigilant, we need to still be vigilant, but that's really important to note about the United States. Now, American Jews did face discrimination in employment, housing, um, membership in certain social clubs and resorts, uh, and acceptance in certain colleges uh, and medical schools due to Jewish quotas. Um, but this is really only through the first, up until the first half of the 20th century. And a lot of the anti-Semitic leaders in our country, like Henry Ford in the 1920s, uh, Father Coughlin, who was a Catholic priest who had a, a radio station um, in the 1930s, uh, Charles Lindbergh in the 1940s and the political anti-Semitism, and even the influence of the Ku Klux Klan, that really did decline after World War II and the Holocaust. Um, and that's really important to note because What's happened right now, in the last three to five years, when we talk about rising anti-Semitism, and we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of our time, is putting that in that perspective, that we really have come a long way. We can't backtrack. We need to you know, learn from the lessons of the past. Um, but this does not happen necessarily in, in a vacuum. So, this is the latest FBI um, hate crimes statistic. It just came out a few weeks ago um, from 2020. And it shows that 57.5% of all religious bias crimes in America target Jews. And Jews make up less than 2% of the American population, yet they are the recipients of almost 60% of uh, anti-religious um, bias hate crimes. We've also noticed in the last few years that anti-Semitism has become more, more violent and, and more open. And this is illustrated by the attack in, in Pittsburgh, um, actually three years ago, uh, this October. This was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in our history. 
and also by the attacks against Jews in Poway, California, Jersey City, New Jersey, Muncie, New York, and the continuous attacks against Jews, um, specifically the Haredi Jews, the ultra-Orthodox Jews in, in Brooklyn. So to capture what was happening, because we're seeing these incidents happening, we're seeing them become more violent and more open, um, American Jewish Committee, uh, AJC, surveyed American Jews on their experience with anti-Semitism in America. And I want to share a few of our findings with you this, this evening. So the first finding is that 9 in 10 American Jews believe that anti-Semitism is a problem in the US today, and 37% say it's a very serious problem. Eight in 10 American Jews say that anti-Semitism has increased in the last five years, with the plurality, with the 43% saying that it's, it's increased a lot. This is a real concern. We found that more than one in three American Jews in the last five years have been targeted um, by anti-Semitism, um, both online and offline. And the majority of the attacks, though, did happen online. And so we did a deeper dive into, into where they were experiencing anti-Semitism. And these are where the percentages broke out. And I should note that this survey was actually the largest survey of American Jews done by a Jewish organization to date. Uh, it was, had over 1,300 American Jews uh, and a, a sample size that uh, mirrored what the American Jewish fabric looks like. Um, by age, by um, you know, denomination, et cetera. Uh, so 62% of American Jews who had experienced anti-Semitism experienced on Facebook, followed by 33% on Twitter, 10% you know, on YouTube. And again, this is going to reflect where American Jews spend their time, like what social media channels they're on. And this is for American Jewish adults. I'll tell you right now, and we're hoping to do this in the coming years, but if we were to survey American Jewish uh, youth or young people between the ages of 14 and maybe 24, the number on TikTok would probably mirror Facebook. We also asked if they had ever avoided certain situations um, out of their concern or fear of, of, of being Jewish. And this was a question that we actually pulled from a survey that we did, in, um, or not, we didn't do it, but that um, some of our counterparts did in Europe in 2018. And we didn't expect that number to be very high here in the US. You know, we, we looked at what was happening in Europe, we, we figured, you know, with rising anti-Semitism there, it would be much more of an issue. We were surprised in, in 2019, actually, when we did a version of this survey before, that one in four, 25% of American Jews said, yes, I've avoided going someplace, you know, because of, of, of my fear of, 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 as a Jew. That number jumped to 31%, almost one in three in 2020. And this trend data is really important because when you have standalone statistics, they're interesting, but they don't really tell you anything. And when you look at these comparative numbers, you can see here that this is, that this is getting worse. And I'll, I'll share with you that in the next month, we'll actually be able to add to 2021 to this, to this chart and be able to see you know, what, what's happened. We actually have a survey in the field right now uh, to see how, how things have changed. So now we come to a very interesting point, very interesting part of, of our survey. We also surveyed Americans, the general US public, about anti-Semitism, their perceptions of anti-Semitism experiences, if they've, if they've noticed it. And one thing that we realized was that while American Jews are very concerned about rising anti-Semitism, most non-Jewish Americans really aren't aware um, that it's an issue, that it's rising, or even what it is. And so this uh, graph right here, you can see that 14% of Americans think that anti-Semitism has decreased in the last five years. And a number that's not on the screen is the number 39% of Americans who think it stayed the same. But what we're dealing with is 53% of Americans who say that anti-Semitism has either stayed the same or has decreased in the last five years, which is actually the opposite of, of what is happening. But this chart is actually, was actually kind of the more shocking for us um, studying this data. 
The very first question that we asked Americans um, before we even asked if they thought it was a problem or if anti-Semitism was rising, the very first question we asked was, have you heard the word anti-Semitism? Do you know what this term means? And we found that 46% of Americans really aren't familiar with the word anti-Semitism. 21% had never heard it before. And then 25% had heard it, but actually couldn't, couldn't say what it was, couldn't describe it. Uh, we did define what it was before we asked them the other questions. But this is really important because when we talk about rising anti-Semitism, when we talk about the need to, to fight it, what's happening in our country, we're dealing with almost half of the population not really knowing what we're talking about when we, when we say uh, anti-Semitism. So this is, is really important. So this, what, what I just shared really kind of sets the stage for, for what's happening 75 years after Auschwitz, like right here in America. Like this is what we're seeing in this moment right now. And the question that I get often is why? Why is this, why is this happening? Why is this happening now? You, know, you would think that anti-Semitism would have ended in the Holocaust. We know better. We know it didn't. We know it has a 2,000 year history. And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet to, to solve it. Um, I have eight reasons. None of them justify anti-Semitism, but they're very important, these root causes, if you will, because they help us identify where we need to go, like what we need to do to, to, to push back against uh, the rising tide of, of anti-Semitism. And the first on this list is ignorance, as shown in the, the previous two slides, is this lack of knowledge about anti-Semitism and that it's rising. The second is rising economic uncertainty in our country. This is a, there's a long history, actually, of, of blaming Jews for economic woes. Um, this goes back to the medie medieval ages. Um, but we've seen this here, um, really, from even in the last 10 years, starting with the recession, um, even the recent uh, collapse um, of the stock market. When the pandemic started, we saw Jews being blamed. Um, the third reason is there's a lack of confidence, actually, in democracy and government. And this is a, an interesting progression we've seen just in the last year, that a lot of anti-government movements, um, both on the far right, but also on the far left, also espouse anti-Semitism, um, seeing Jews as in control of government, as being behind government, um, blaming uh, you know, Jews for government's failings. So this is a reason. The fourth is an increased emphasis on race and national identity. So in our country, um, in, the in the last five years, between 2015 and 2020, there's been a 55% increase in white supremacists and white nationalist groups in our country, 55% increase. And what we know about these white nationalist groups is they actually see Jews as almost like enemy number one, if you will, and it's because they see Jews as pretending to be white, but actually trying to bring in immigrants into our country to quote unquote, um, you know, upend the, the white race. Um, and they, this is referred to sometimes as replacement theory or, or white genocide. So this has become a big issue in our country in the last five years. And this is also a reason for, for anti-Semitism rising in America. The fifth is the fading legacy of the Holocaust. And I mentioned a few facts, unfortunately, some statistics about the lack of Holocaust knowledge in, in our country for young people. Um, but just as the survivor generation passes away, and this is actually why this exhibit here and what um, is happening in Kansas City around Holocaust education is so important, um, is, is the need to, to hold on to those two stories because so many young people don't know where unchecked anti-Semitism can lead, one, or they think it ended in 1945 when their history book chapter on the Holocaust ended. And there is a disconnect between the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and that it's still a very real issue uh, in the US today. Uh, a sixth reason for the rise is, has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, with the polarization between the left and the right on the conflict, but um, also anti-Israel, anti-Semitism. And this was an issue that um, we actually see, unfortunately, on, on college campuses. We see this in certain progressive spaces um, where Jews are blamed for Israeli actions or where Israel is treated as kind of almost a collective Jew or as a Jew among nations where classic anti-Semitic tropes are used 
uh, against Israel, and I'm not talking about criticizing Israel, that is, that is fine, um, but where anti-Semitism is used for that criticism. And so we've seen this rise, especially as there's com a conflict in the Middle East, we see Jews here in America being, um, being attacked and affected. And we actually um, recorded an 80% increase in anti-Semitism in May 2021. Um, after, during and after the conflict between Hamas and Gaza and Israel, uh, were Jews here in America from Los Angeles to uh, New York, from Seattle to South Florida, uh, where they were attacked or Jewish institutions were vandalized uh, in response. So the seventh, uh, seventh reason is the internet and social media. If, if someone was to ask me, you know, Holly, pick one reason for why anti-Semitism is rising, right now. I'd pick number seven. As much as, you know, I'm so thankful for, for, for the internet, and I would say this a lot during the pandemic, how I was so thankful that we can connect over Zoom, um, social media and various online sites have really been platforms um, for the spread of anti-Semitic conspiracies, mis and disinformation, really launching paths for some of these, some of these lies. And the speed at which they spread it's unprecedented. And we know that lies spread six times faster than truth, and that it's anger, it's fear, it's lies. That's what's driving the most engagement on these platforms. Um, so this has been a really contributing factor. And then the eighth reason is that there's more sources of anti-Semitism today. And this speaks to the complexity of, of what it is, of what we're talking about. And I want to spend a moment on reason number eight. Here's a screen grab of a few various incidents. And if you look to the, I guess, top, I guess my right, I guess you're probably your left, um, of the Nazi swastika, and also the, the, the picture in the top middle. Um, this is an example of far right anti-Semitism. And I think this is the easiest form of anti-Semitism in America to identify. You know, this is the xenophobic, the traditional, um, nativist, it's often rooted actually in Christian anti-Judaism. Uh, it's white supremacy, white nationalism, fascism, neo-Nazism. And so this was the anti-Semitism. The swastika was drawn on a woman's home in Springfield uh, in 2018. And then the, the case of um, Overland Park uh, with the Jewish Community Center uh, being targeted by a white supremacist where three people were killed um, who, who weren't Jews. Uh, the perpetrator intended to kill Jews. I, I think he actually recently died in, in prison. Um, but this actually example shows that anti-Semitism doesn't just affect, affect Jews. So the far right, most of us it, it can, can understand. It's easy to see. It's, 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 it's obvious. Right now, we're having a challenge, um, and this is more in some urban centers and in certain progressive spaces, uh, with anti-Semitism coming from the other side of the spectrum, from, from the far left. And if you look to the bottom two, the bottom two images, the one on the, um, my right, but um, your, your left and the middle one, this is examples on the far left. So this is with identity-based politics, conspiracy thinking, um, including tropes of Jewish power and control, uh, tropes around Jewish privilege, uh, Israel-related anti-Semitism, post-colonialism, a lot of anti-Americanism is actually tied with, with this source. And so you see here, this is actually um, the, the man that's wearing a Israel has no right to exist sign. Um, and political protests, again, anti-Israel protests, are, are fine, they're part of the democratic process. It's when anti-Semitism is engaged where it becomes problematic. And they're actually standing in front of a synagogue um, in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, and were there for years, years and years and years, where Jewish worshipers would come to synagogue or would go to a Jewish community event or a holiday and would be blasted with these signs saying that you know, Israel has no right to, to exist. And in fact, actually, when we asked in our survey, 84% um, of American Jews say that that statement is actually anti-Semitic, um, actually 85%, and 74% of US adults, give them some credit here, <laughs> said that the statement was, was anti-Semitic because it is denying Jews' right to national self-determination. Um, so that's an example of anti-Semitism on the far left. 
But this middle picture as well is a screen grab of what happened uh, in, in Los Angeles in May. And there was an incident where uh, anti-Israel protesters uh, actually came to a sushi restaurant um, asking people if they were Jewish. Nothing, nothing to do with Israel, but just, you know, are you Jewish? And found Jewish diners and beat them up. And as of a couple days ago, actually, this has a hate crime, official hate crime charge um, in Los Angeles. It was officially declared an anti-Semitic hate crime. Uh, but this is a challenge when we talk about anti-Semitism and, and, and its connection, again, to, to Israel. We also have anti-Semitism coming from religious extremism here in the US. And the picture at the top um, the one we haven't discussed yet is uh, an, an image of um, someone who, in the name of Islam, uh, stabbed multiple times uh, a rabbi in Boston. This just happened in July, a few months ago. Uh, but we also have religious extremism in other forms, too. So I mentioned earlier there was uh, an attack against Jews in Jersey City uh, in 2019. And this, this attack actually didn't get a lot of um, Sorry, didn't get a lot of attention as much as Pittsburgh or, or Poway did, which were perpetrated by white supremacists. But the Jersey City killing was done by uh, two members of the Black Hebrew Israelite group uh, who went to murder Jews in this kosher um, market. Uh, and a, a police officer, as well as a non-Jewish worker, were also murdered. Uh, but this is an example of religious extremism. So we talk about far left, far right, religious extremism. And the last thing I want to mention um, on complexity, just to get, you know, not to um, you know, make, us, make us too concerned that we'll never be able to figure this out, but is Holocaust, educate, uh, Holocaust distortion. And this is a real issue. And I think it's so important to discuss here, especially given the exhibit. Um, especially given the need to, for accurate Holocaust education. So normally I wouldn't necessarily bring this example up. I talk about my three sources as complexity and move on. But I really need to, with the last year and a half during the pandemic, we have seen more inappropriate Holocaust comparisons uh, than I think we, we've had in the last at least two decades. And the challenge here is that, you know, when someone denies the Holocaust, I think it's easy to say that's anti-Semitism. But distorting the Holocaust, um, saying that uh, stay-at-home orders or mask mandates or vaccine mandates um, are like what Hitler did to the Jews, and you see people wearing the, the stars saying that they're not vaccinated, that actually, it lessens what Hitler did. It's an attack on Jewish memory, on, on Jewish identity. And even though people who you make these inappropriate comparisons, like I don't think they're anti-Semitic in intent, the effect, the effect often is anti-Semitism. And uh, anti-Semites do hear, hear that dog whistle. So I want to spend just a couple of, a couple of minutes, and I'm going to go through these examples pretty, pretty quickly, um, because I want to get to the part where we talk about you know, what do we do. Um, but one of, the, one of the challenges is in the United States today, there's actually a, a, a lack of understanding between the historical connections of anti-Semitism and, and what we're seeing today. And um, again, that's why I think the education here is so important that it's not just anti-Semitism now, it's that, that long history. It didn't just start in 1939 you know, or 1933 when Hitler came to power. It really had long history. And what we're finding even in the 21st century, in 2021, is a lot of the anti-Semitism has roots in the medieval ages in, in Europe. And yet many people won't be able, don't recognize that because they don't know that history. And, and this is one of our huge challenges. And I want to just give three quick um, examples. And we actually have a resource called Translate Hate. It is a compendium of over 40 different anti-Semitic terms, themes, and tropes. Um, that uh, the JCRB, AJC, Kansas City can, can provide. It's also on AJC's website. It's called Translate Hate. I'm going to show you three right now, um, just to kind of get a sense of, 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 of one of these challenges between the historical, um, hist the, the history and what we're seeing now. So something like the blood libel, which again is, when I, when I say this out loud, 
you might think that there's no way that this still exists in 2021, but this was a medieval accusation uh, that Jews would kidnap and murder Christian children to use their blood uh, for ritual purposes, often to make um, matzah for Passover. And this is an example of a woodcut uh, wood uh, from the 15th century. But all of these examples are from either the last few months or the last few years, and they're actually in some way modern day blood libels. The first image is actually, actually is a picture of a Save the Children slash QAnon rally. And I know QAnon is not in the news as much as it was maybe a year ago. Um, this you know, far right group uh, who, who saw the world as controlled by a satanic cabal of, of pedophiles and most of them were Jewish, Democrats, journalists, Hollywood elites, etc. But the core of the QAnon conspiracy was that there was a child sex trafficking ring um, where these globalists, many of them Jewish, would be doing illicit things with, with children. Um, and again, if you, when you kind of read some of these texts, there, it harkens back to kind of this, this blood libel, which is really, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's really unfortunate, but it shows that we pull, like people who are using these conspiracies today are pulling from things that are familiar, are pulling, from, pulling things from, from the past. The middle image, I think, is a little more obvious of a blood libel, um, but this was a, a political cartoon that was posted in 2015. It shows someone who's Jewish um, eating a Palestinian child and drinking uh, his blood. And the bottom image is from a rally just in May um, in Los Angeles. And I know the sign is a little hard to see, but in the middle you have an image of Netanyahu, former Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu, with a Hitler mustache about to eat a Palestinian uh, child. So these are some examples. Poisoning the well is a, another uh, trope that you think would have been left in the Middle Ages, where Jews were blamed for poisoning the medieval, like the, the drinking wells in, in Europe, and especially in the 14th century during the bubonic plague where Christians you know, were, were getting more sick and, and, and Jews because they had a lot of different practices, for whether it be kosher, cleanliness, washing hands as part of their culture and religion, weren't getting as sick. Uh, so Christians blame Jews for um, poisoning the drinking well. And connecting actually Jews with disease is something that was brought to the modern era. In fact, in our country in the 1890s, American Jews were blamed for tuberculosis outbreaks here in the United States. Um, but Hitler also would use, not, during Nazi propaganda, connect Jews with vermin, bringing bacteria, etc. I still would have hoped that this accusation would have um, ended at least with the Holocaust, but in 2020 with the uh, pandemic, we saw a whole new um, kind of trove of anti-Semitic um, cartoons, caricatures, uh, blaming Jews for creating COVID-19. You can see this um, kind of uh, anti or this uh, Jewish figure um, in a Trojan horse, kind of you know bringing the the disease to to, to, to other countries, to other people. Um, we heard things such as. Jews create, uh, created COVID in order to profit off the vaccine. That was one that was kind of repeated on, on the internet. Uh, and then also the connection, with, again, with, with Israel as the Jewish state. And uh, COVID-1948 became a popularized hashtag on, on Instagram, on Twitter, on social media channels. Again, 1948 being the year that the UN, uh, or actually 1947 that the UN officially created Israel, but became, Israel became a, a state in 1948, saying that Israel is a virus. Like this is a virus, and they're using COVID instead of the Star of David and the flag. It's a, it's it's the virus. So this trope, where something that was from the 14th century, is being pulled from to create um, anti-Semitic images and, and to spread anti-Semitism in our country today. Uh, and the last one is control. And I think this is something that um, some of us are, are are familiar with this idea of control or power or manipulation. Um, a lot of these accusations are, are rooted in something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was a fictitious account of, of saying that Jews were trying to you know, control the world uh, from the uh, early 20th century uh, in printed action in Zara's Russia. But I want to show you a couple of images. So you see the Nazi propaganda, the, the Jewish person and the German businessman. 
But then you see this image in the middle, um, and some of you probably remember, remember this image maybe from a couple years ago. It was published in the New York Times. Uh, and you see someone who's uh, president, or, uh, prime minister, former prime minister Netanyahu depicted as a dog. Uh, leading a, a blind President Trump, um, you know, kind of to do to do his bidding, and this example again of Jews leading blind world leaders, of, of Jews being like the hidden hand beyond, like behind world events, has a centuries of year, years of history, um, and often actually leading to to thousands of Jews being killed, um, and especially in, in, in Europe even before the Holocaust. But this isn't limited to just the, uh, the, the left, for instance. This, this cartoon came from the left side of the political spectrum. But if we look to the other image, this comes from the right side of the political spectrum. And you have George Soros, who is a, a Jew, you know, American Jewish, Hungarian born, but American Jewish um, uh, finance, a billionaire, philanthropist. And y you can criticize George Soros for who he is as a person, but when you start uh, or, or if you don't agree with things that he's done, but when it becomes anti-Semitic, when he kind of takes on the kind of again that collective uh, Jew um, trope. So, for instance, the the puppet master, the you know trying to control uh, world leaders. Uh, this is an example of an anti-Semitic um, cartoon on the, the the right. So, I want to move to conclusions, and at this point, um, I have about f five to ten minutes. We're actually, probably about five minutes left. So, if you have some questions, I'm getting to like the good part about why this this matters, what we can do about it. But if you start some questions on what's happening and some content, go ahead and pass your um, questions. Uh, I guess stage stage right. Um, you're right. There's going to be um, some of my colleagues walking up the the stairs to collect questions for our question and answer uh, session together. But why does this matter? You know, because I just heard a lot of information of what we're seeing, what this looks like, how American Jews are feeling, what Americans don't know. Why does this matter? Um, and why is it important to non-Jews to recognize anti-Semitism, to speak out against it and help combat it? So we know that the higher levels of anti-Semitism in a country, um, including anti-Semitic conspiracies, actually mean that the society is less willing to uphold democratic values, to uphold equal rights. Um, it's actually been said that anti-Semitism is society's early warning sign because anti-Semitism is not only an attack on Jews, but an assault on the core values of any democratic and pluralistic society. And I'll explain just for one example. You know, for thousands of years, you know, Jews have been blamed for a variety of ills and issues. Uh, again, anti-Semitism is the longest hatred. But the pattern of scapegoating and othering really starts with anti-Semitism, starts against the Jewish community you know, even 2,000 years ago. So when we look at how minority communities in our country might be treated today, might be othered, might be scapegoated, we actually can better help them when we learn lessons from, from anti-Semitism. And I, there's um, someone named Eric Ward, he's at the Western State Center Executive Director, and he says this really well when he's talking about anti-black racism. Um, you know, he's a black activist, He's also very outspoken against anti-Semitism, but he actually goes as far to say that anti-Semitism is a particular and potent form of racism so central to white supremacy. Again, remember that anti-Semitism forms that core, that core of white supremacy. He says anti-Semitism is a particular and potent form of, of racism so central to white supremacy that black people would not win our freedom without tearing it down. So when we fight anti-Semitism in America today, we're really fighting for the, you know, the health, the well-being, the equality of our society and our democracy. And this is effectively why countering anti-Semitism requires non-Jews. So what can we do? And I, I warn you, there's a little bit of text on these slides, and I'm happy to make these slides available after the lecture tonight. But really, it comes down to three things. The first is the recognition. And that's actually why I spent a little more time on, on what it looks like today, recognizing anti-Semitism. Because once you recognize it, then you can go to the part step two and three, where it's really raising awareness, um, and especially for non-Jews to, to raise awareness. Uh, I think in our country right now, anti-Semitism is often minimized or tolerated because it doesn't match other forms of hatred, or, or Jews actually appear to be uh, doing just fine, um, or because Jews are white, they cannot face discrimination. Like This is some of the language that we hear. 
So even if you don't personally experience anti-Semitism or witness anti-Semitism, be ready to share what it is, why it's a problem, why it's actually a foundation for so many hatreds, for so many conspiracies, um, especially around um, conspiracies of, of, of control or power or manipulation, uh, and that it's a prejudice that doesn't just affect Jews, but that affects um, all of us. And then the lastly, and I think most importantly, is the taking action piece. And of course, this is going to look different in different settings, but um, being active with your elected officials. So we, we always ask to you know, support legislation that helps protect the Jewish community security. That's really the mo most important to start. Um, but education around the Holocaust. Um, there are many states in the United States that have not yet mandated Holocaust education. And so that's something that we, that we support. Um, but also holding our elected officials accountable. Um, to, to fight anti-Semitism, but if they say something anti-Semitic or if they make that inappropriate Holocaust comparison, to call them out, um, especially if it comes within our own party. I think it's easy to point fingers at the other side, but as I hope I have shown tonight, that really does come from, from all sides. So I want to bring this to, to an end. And when we think about those three pieces, oh, actually I'll go back one slide real quick. When we think about recognition, raising awareness, and responding through action, they really are part and parcel of the responsibility we have as Americans. And I want to conclude this evening's presentation actually on the, with a note on responsibility. So several of you actually may be familiar with the work of Holocaust survivor um, Viktor Frankl. I don't know if, if any of you have read Man's Search for Meeting. If, Anyone has not read *Man's Search for Meaning*. Um, it's it's one of the most the, the book about the Holocaust I, I advocate the most for for my students, um, but for anyone who's who's interested. So Frankel, he was an Austrian um, neurologist and psychiatrist, and he actually developed this concept called logotherapy, which focuses on the meaning of human existence as well as on man's search for meaning. And Logos, uh, actually to go back to, to Greece, to go back to, to Crete even for a moment, Logos is the Greek word for meaning. And Logotherapy makes man aware of the hidden Logos, this, this hidden meaning in his existence. And when Frankel was taken to Auschwitz, he had already developed these theories, but his time in Auschwitz allowed him to prove them. And he recalled, and this is a quote from him, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from man but one thing. The last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way." End, end quote. After Auschwitz, Frankl concluded that ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather he must recognize that it is he who is asked. He said, we had to teach the despairing men that it did not, it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. End quote. Thus, logotherapy really sees in responsibleness the very essence of human existence. And the responsibility really is on, on each of us, on each of us here today, on us as engaged citizens. And so I want to leave us with this quote um, from, from the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who captures this line about responsibility so well, um, specifically with our responsibility to combat anti-Semitism. And he says, Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. The hated cannot cure the hate. Jews can't cure anti-Semitism. Jews can't be expected to be the ones fighting anti-Semitism. And the onus to cure the hatred of anti-Semitism is actually on non-Jews, on all of us as Americans. So thank you so much for your attention this evening. I will now open the floor to question and answers and invite my colleague, Gabby. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so this is interesting. Why do we continue to use the word anti-Semitism when people don't know what the term means? Is it time to retire this word and just simply use the word Jew hatred? This is a great question because I always get it when I say how few people know what the word means. Um, so a few things. I personally like the word anti-Semitism because it does act as an umbrella term from you know, Christian anti-Judaism to political um, you know, anti-Jewish sentiment to what we're seeing right now related to the state of Israel. Uh, to you know, you know other other forms, if you will, it kind of is this 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 capture, uh, and other words also don't have uh, you know that conspiratorial element with it, including the word Jew hatred. Again, that's a very powerful word. I think there actually is a place for it, um, especially when you're dealing with challenges of anti-Semitism on the left, on the far left. Uh, when you use the word Jew hatred, it, it kind of it kind of fills that um, language that they're kind of already using. But hatred, again, doesn't capture that conspiracy piece, which is so important. So I usually just say anti-Semitism, we need more education about what that word means or um, defining it. And that's a, another thing that we're working on right now in, all, in our advocacy is um, something called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism with working definition that's been adopted by countries all over the world, but it gives all these examples of what anti-Semitism is and, and, and how to define it. Um, and we need that consistency across the board when we're talking about this global problem. Um, to begin to use different words, I think has, it can help, but I think anti-Semitism, at least for now, is, is, is here to stay. I will tell you, this, um, we are actually asking that question right now. We have a survey in the field of um, 1,400 American Jews, uh, so even more than what we did, what the statistics that you saw. And we're asking American Jews across the United States if they have a preference on the term, if one resonates more. And we're actually also asking uh, US adults uh, if they have a feeling toward anti-Semitism or, or Jew hatred, that, that actual word. So the, the, the jury is out, but um, we'll, 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 we'll report back. Well, I think you make a great point, Holly, that not all anti-Semitism might be classified as Jew hatred, right? Like people often tend to think of uh, these perceptions or these stereotypes as positive. And we, that's a lot of the education that we do when we're out there in schools and with companies and organizations explaining to people about anti-Semitism. They, they think they're being complimentary. They think that they're, they're being positive towards the Jewish community by repeating some of these stereotypes of all Jews are wealthy, all Jews are powerful, they control the media, et cetera. Um, so that might not fit as, as nicely into the Jew hatred label. Very good. So we have a lot of questions about young people, as expected. Um, one question is, what would cause young people to think that Jews caused the Holocaust? But then we have several questions as well about college campuses okay. and um, discussing what's going on on college campuses, particularly at elite schools, and how should college students best respond to anti-Semitism? I think between social media and young people, and they're related actually, because young people are on social media and they're also in college, uh, we have and should be having the most conversations about anti-Semitism actually. Uh, we even have a program, American Jewish Committee has um, a nationwide program for high school students. So even before college, it's called Leaders for Tomorrow. And I actually talked to some of these high school students about what they're dealing with with anti-Semitism because I tell them, what you're experiencing now is really going to be the anti-Semitism of the future. Uh, you know, in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years, like your peers are going to be the leaders in our country and various you know, governments of the civil society. What are you experiencing? Because we need to get ahead of, of, of this. And the question um, about lack of Holocaust knowledge. You, you know, this is a survey done by the Claims Conference. I, I don't know how the question was, was asked. I, I haven't actually seen the, the, the questionnaire itself. I have a guess. I'll make, I'll make a, an educated guess. 
One, I think there probably were some anti-Semites who answered as such. But I think um, what we see when we talk about anti-Semitism is that it's a familiar. Um, historian Deborah Lipstadt um, out of Emory University, she's actually going to be the new special envoy to monitor combat anti-Semitism at the State Department if she's confirmed um, under the, the Biden administration. She actually uh, has said that anti-Semitism is, is familiar. There's so many things to choose from. Uh, you know, people might not know it's anti-Semitic, but they're like, oh, you see about the Jewish, they recognize it. Like, it's part of our, um, it's, it's part of our grammar. In fact, there's another historian who said that anti-Semitism is part of the grammar of the West. So I actually think, and I don't have any proof, but um, when you looked at that question about the Holocaust, and Jews, and I don't think the people answering, they heard about the Holocaust, they heard that it was connected with Jews. So when the question was asked, did Jews cause the Holocaust, they think, oh, I've heard of the Holocaust and I've heard of Jews, so they must, that, yes. I want to give those students the benefit of the doubt. Many of them, English might be a second language. I, I don't, we don't know, we have to do a little more, more digging. Um, but still, that's a starting point. We have to make sure that we correct that. Whoever answered the questions that way, I would love to get back to them and say, this is, this is not the case. Um, I'll flip to, to college campuses quickly. They're not a monolith. Um, we do hear about the ones that make the news, some of these elite schools um, that have strong uh, anti-Israel components, um, strong you know, even students for justice in Palestine groups, um, other groups that might be funded by the Muslim Brotherhood, um, as, as being problematic for, for Jewish students. And that shouldn't down, I, I tell, Jewish students tell me this a lot, I'm like, talk about the negative, Holly, but you also talk about the positive, because there's really robust you know, Jewish life and, 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 and through Hillel, and there's these really great experiences, but my job is to work on the negative and on anti-Semitism. And we are seeing young Jews on campus having a hard time being involved in certain progressive spaces because they feel like they have to renounce part of their Jewish identity, and specifically their Zionism. Um, and their, you know, a right like affinity toward, toward Israel, their relatives in Israel, like their connection to the Jewish state, their, their own history, um, and it really being almost the conflict, really being almost boiled down to a white versus black or oppressor versus oppressed. Some of even our language around racism here in our own country being taken and put on um, a centuries-old conflict uh, in the the Middle East, and that's really hard for Jewish students to be able to try to want to fit in in college, want to be involved in rightful, you know, um, uh, state with climate change, for instance, or women's rights, and have to be asked to renounce their Zionism. And there is that double standard that we're seeing on campus, and I think um, we're responding to it, we're trying to. I mean, I'll give one example. AJC, we're actually having a two things that we do. We are having a university president summit uh, in New York City in February where, where we're bringing university presidents from these major schools to New York to have an entire summit on anti-Semitism on campus and what it looks like and, and how, what students are feeling um, is one piece. And another piece is we bring faculty and campus leaders to, to Israel to engage with Israeli universities and counterparts and, and really showcase what's happening on the ground so they, they don't get swept under with social media, with some of this like emotion that's happening amongst the students. Ideally, we'd hope that the administration can, can take the, the, the high ground, the high road, for a very complex situation. Um, but this is, I think, one of the biggest challenges of our time. And I'll, I'll add a couple of points to that. And I want to reiterate Holly's mention of the LIFT program, Leaders for Tomorrow, because that's actually a program that we do offer in Kansas City for Jewish high school students. We have our third cohort starting in a couple of weeks. Um, if you do have a Jewish high school student, it could be sophomore, junior, or senior, um, who wants to participate this year, please be in touch with us ASAP since that cohort is starting in a couple of weeks. But, that is an incredible way um, for us to prepare 
our, you know, our next generation of leaders or just really any Jewish youth who's going to go to college and experience these kinds of challenges because it's so easy to just freeze up in the moment. Um, and if you don't have the education that, you know, the translate hate and everything that you talked about today, you might kind of, you know, that what they say about anti-Semitism, you, you know it when you, it's like a, like a bad smell, you know it when you smell it. Um, you might kind of know what it is, but you, you don't know enough to be able to explain to somebody why what they're saying is problematic. So that education for Jewish youth is so important, and we're so proud to be offering that, you know, in partnership with AJC. Um, the other thing that I know uh, that AJC does and focuses on in the college space is coalition building and really making sure that Jewish students know how to explain their identities um, and their, their selves and their community to people of other communities, how to create relationships with the Latino Student Union and the Black Student Union and you know, other, other communities that are in leadership on campus so that we can work together on on you know issues of mutual concern and stand up for one another when we need you know that allyship and that of course always goes both ways. So AJC does a fantastic job as well of of training college students to to really be thoughtful and strategic coalition builders on campus. Um, I wonder if you can also for a couple of moments, Holly, speak to us about bringing you know, the state of, of anti-Semitism in America into a more global context. Thanks, Guy. I'm, I'm glad you asked because our lecture was just on America, you know, anti-Semitism in America. Um, but, but even before coming to AJC, I, I worked in the, the U.S. Department of State, and my job was to focus on every country and anti-Semitism except for America, as, as you know, we are the, the, the foreign affairs branch of the U.S. government. And if, when you look at what's happening around the world, and you you know you learn that anti-Semitism really kind of know, um, knows no bounds. Um, there's you know different you know linguistic, cultural uh, histories. There's anti-Semitism where there's no Jews, um, but specifically when we look back to to Europe. Europe experienced a, a rise in anti-Semitism about a decade before we did. Uh, really, in the early 2000s. Um, we were beginning to see, um, especially in Western Europe and in, in, in France, um, but also in, in Hungary and in, in different sources of anti-Semitism actually, um, coming, coming from, from different places, an uptick. Uh, and it was a kind of new forms of anti-Semitism, again, where, where Jews might be attacked for what was happening in Israel, uh, for instance. And we were noticing this, this rise, and there was this kind of well, at least that's not happening here. At least rising anti-Semitism, you know, each year after year is not happening in the United States. And I do think, oh, well, I, I know that that did change. We usually point to, to Pittsburgh, but you can even go back to Charlottesville in 2017. There, there were, um, you know, foundation, like we talk about even the Holocaust, it didn't just happen right away. There was these steps. And that's what, when we do, when we do trainings for civil society, for government leaders on, kind of how to prevent the Holocaust. Now we, we, we go back in time and you see those steps. We can look back in our own history in 2014, 2015, 2016, and start to see those steps of our, our own rise. But um, it, it, Europe did experience a rise before before we did, although we know the transatlantic trends, especially with the internet, um, there's really the, the boundaries aren't there. But also in the United Kingdom, uh, even the last few years, uh, I think if someone had said that there'll be, you know, anti-Semitism, like institutional anti-Semitism on the left, which is, you know, left is usually a party of, of anti-racism, a platform of anti-racism, um, like we saw in the, in the UK with Jeremy Corbyn, where there was institutional anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, and that whole scandal um, of what happened, uh, we can look to that actually, and when we have issues, and we do have some issues in the, the further left in our in our country related to anti-Semitism, there are lessons to be learned and to be taken from um, what happened in the UK a few years before. So we're 
you know, we're America, America's unique in many ways, and I tried to lay that out at the beginning about the American Jewish experience here, um, but it doesn't mean that we're immune to anti-Semitism, and you can see some of these um, incidents and trends that have happened other places in the world um, coming here, but also vice versa. And one all instance I'll, I'll make, or one uh, example I'll give, is with QAnon. Um, QAnon uh, really had its major roots here in the United States, and it has actually since been exported from here to Germany, to Japan, to other places as well. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges we have as well as the, the global connections. Absolutely. I'm sure that you could also give a whole lecture just on that. <laughs> Um, I know that we are short on time, and I apologize for not being able to get to all of your wonderful questions, but for my final question, I'll ask you to expand a little bit on social media. You know, we've talked about it over the past hour. Social media is, plays a huge role in the proliferation of, of anti-Semitism today. Sort of what is your recommendation to these companies? What sort of work are you and NAJC doing with these companies? Um, and what are you trying to get them to do to, to be a better ally in that fight? It's definitely something that we're seeing here with our youth um, and is a big problem you know, among, amongst the, the younger age group. So this is going to be, the, the, the next 10 years is going to be really where this is the focus uh, has to be. So I should start by saying there's been some improvement. I know we think we read the news today and we hear about Facebook and we hear about these things and we feel like you know, they're, they're evil and they can't change. <laughs> there's no, there's, um, but even five years ago, there, if you look at even with the rise of ISIS in 2015, ISIS used Twitter to attract, you know, its, its followers to promote it. They had like 70,000 different, you know, accounts. And it wasn't until too late when Twitter finally banned ISIS that we realized that it that had an effect on its ability to recruit, a terrorist organization's ability to recruit, you would have thought that that social media company would have done that right away. And as they were developing, and almost too fast, you know, um, the ability to curb hate speech, the ability to take down content, to, to not allow bad actors to operate on the platform had already started and it's kind of so ingrained that they're almost now doing this, this cleanup. Um, but the policies are stronger. I will say if you read um, content like the you know, community standards or the policies of many of these companies, they're not bad. Even around anti-Semitism, they're, they're actually not bad. It's the implementation, and it's often the, the algorithm it's, itself actually promoting, unfortunately, a lot of this content and the cross-pollination of whether it be um, you know, misogynists or anti-Semites, like connecting them over shared interests. Uh, we saw this actually with Facebook groups, for instance. Um, so a few a few key things. Um, the first is they need a standard definition of what anti-Semitism is. So a lot of their policies will protect Jews as like in a protected characteristic of individuals, um, but they don't have an understanding of the conspiratorial nature of anti-Semitism. Uh, even Holocaust denial was allowed on Facebook until actually a year ago this month. Um, and, and even now you can still find it, but officially it's been banned and that was a fight that was saying, oh, you know. Um, so it's, there's no definition, like a common definition of what anti-Semitism is and what it looks like. So that's problem number one. The second is a lack of transparency. Um, the platforms are not transparent at all with um, of how they're moderating content, the, the algorithms themselves, how that's actually promoting anti-Semitism. We're seeing a little bit of this actually if you follow some of the cases um, testified before Congress about the platforms um, having to kind of talk about what goes on beyond that, behind the scenes. Um, the content moderation as well. So they're hiring more and more moderators, a lot of them, but these moderators aren't trained in what anti-Semitism looks like, um, in the linguistic and cultural nuances of anti-Semitism, what anti-Semitism looks like in Malaysia, for instance, um, even though there's no Jews, that, that person needs to be able to know that history and that you know, the linguistic context in order to remove, rightfully remove content, and that does not exist at all. And the last thing I'll, I'll say actually is a lot of the, the, the culture within these tech platforms themselves, um, 
I, I don't think there really is that, that knowledge of where kind of some of this unchecked anti-Semitism or hatred can can lead with the product itself is you know to generate engagement, right? And it is that it lies and, and that fear again that predicate the most engagement. Uh, so AJC, we, we do work with the major platforms. We work with Facebook slash Instagram, with TikTok, with um, Google slash YouTube, Twitter, uh, and Clubhouse actually is a new audio um, platform on trying to tell them what it looks like and refine those policies. Um, but it is an uphill, um, it is an uphill, it's pushing a rock up, up a hill, but I think the momentum's changing. I think we're hearing even the news now, the whistleblower case, that people are showing that what's happening behind the scenes is that they're prioritizing profit in many cases over people, over, and I'm hoping that in the next few years we'll be able to kind of push back against the, the hatred that's been on, on social media. And it's not just for Jews. I should say this is this is something that's affecting you know, Black Americans, um, you know, the LGBTQ community, women. Like this is this is something that's uniting, I think, a lot of different groups. So that speaks to that coalition building um, piece of our work. Absolutely. Well, I said that that was my final question, but actually, because I'm going to make a point after this, I do want to ask you on a more personal note, a personal and professional note. Holly, you're an evangelical Christian. You know, how did you come to this work? How did you find yourself um, dedicated now working at AJC as the U.S. Director of Combating Anti-Semitism? Um, what might that sort of help us un better understand about the role of the non-Jewish community in, in combating anti-Semitism? Well, thanks for that question. I don't know if evangelical Christian is a good thing here in Kansas City or a bad thing. Not a bad thing. Okay, because um, I'm from Los Angeles, and in D.C. now it's kind of a bad thing, but um, yeah, I, did, I grew up a Baptist. Um, my, my family is actually from Mississippi, um, and Baptist minister. So I came to this a, a long way, but um, I was fortunate to have a best friend who was Jewish growing up. And one of the other questions that we're actually asking in our survey right now that's in the field to, the, to Americans is, do you know someone who's Jewish? Because even though that Jews make up 2% of the population here, I would guess that many people in America don't know Jews. You know, they, they just don't know, yeah, they don't know, who, they don't even know someone who's Jewish. I had a best friend who was Jewish, and when I was five or six years old, I tried to convert him to Christianity. Um, learned in Sunday school and really laid, you know, laid down the law, and there was a Christian Jewish um, kind of uh, argument between our parents uh, one evening. Um, but I didn't know, and even growing up though, I never learned Jewish history. I didn't know the history of the Holocaust. Even as a Christian, I didn't know uh, the root, roots of Christian anti Judaism, actually, how so much of what Adolf Hitler would rely on was already kind of part of a anti Jewish Christian culture. Um, this is, you know, not, not the Bible itself, but like just even how, the, how it was interpreted by, by church fathers, by, by um, scholars. And I didn't know that at all. I didn't really know about the Holocaust. And so I had kind of a, a wake up moment so when I studied abroad in Poland that my own kind of history, actually, my own religious traditions that actually played a role in this. And um, I learned quick, quickly that actually. Jews shouldn't be the ones to, to fight anti-Semitism. It actually needs to be non-Jews. And, uh, and I get a very surprised look when people look at my title and they find out that I'm not Jewish. They assume I am because that's my job. And I say, it actually should be the opposite. No Jews should be the ones you know, fighting um, anti-Semitism. It should be uh, non-Jews. So I've started actually in Holocaust education and have, have worked my way to fighting anti-Semitism full time. Well, we're very grateful to have you at AGC. <laughs> so thank you once again to our partners at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, Union Station, and of course to Holly for coming out and, and giving this fantastic lecture. This is just, you know, the beginning of hopefully a broader education that everyone in this room, you know, can pursue on, on anti-Semitism and understanding contemporary anti-Semitism. I want to go back to the quote that she had um, you know, on the slide previous, that anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish issue, and it's really not an issue that the Jewish community can solve alone. And so everybody who, um, you know, came to this event tonight, all of you have taken a really important 
first step um, in educating yourselves on anti-Semitism, and we're so grateful for that. Um, to continue your education, I would encourage you to visit our website, jcrbajc.org. We have fantastic resources there um, that you can further your learning with, as well as ajc.org, and there's a lot of overlap, as you might imagine. Um, our organization will also come into your church, into your company, into your organization, and give a presentation and a training on Jewish holidays, how to accommodate Jewish students or staff in your community, as well as understanding contemporary anti-Semitism. And we would love to do that. So please be in touch with us if that's something of interest to you. Um, and with that, thank you again, Holly. Thank you, everyone. For coming.